All right, so far in this course, we have talked about viruses getting into cells. We've talked about making more genomes. We've talked about making protein. Now it's time to put it all together and make new virus particles. So this will be the last stage of the infectious cycle that we're going to talk about. Then we move into disease. So today is all about assembly. So all viruses go through a series of steps to make new virus particles. Many of them are in common, and they're, all, they're shown here. So the yellow parts are common to all viruses. Formation of the structural units, assembly of the shell by the interaction of these units, and then you have to put the nucleic acid genome inside the capsid. We'll talk about that today. Some viruses get an envelope. Not all, as you know, are envelope, but some do. So that's in blue. It's not common to all viruses. Uh, release from the host cell. So this is labeled yellow here. What do you think about that? Is that the right color for that? Release from the host cell. Does that happen for all viruses? Come on, guys. It was on your exam. Tobacco mosaic virus doesn't get released. Tobacco mosaic virus, yeah, it doesn't really get released unless you break, unless an insect goes in and pulls it out or the plant gets broken. And so some plant viruses. What other viruses don't ever get released? It's on your exam. <laughs> which, which ones? Rhoda? No, they get released. If the retrovirus is just integrated and not making particles, it won't get released. But there are some viruses that get made in the cytoplasm. They're particles, but they never get released. Yeast and fungi, well, yeast are fungi. There's some viruses of, uh, of yeasts that never get released from the cell. So this color isn't quite right. And then maturation. So all the, all the particles have to mature. So we're going to talk about some of these steps today. And so far, we've looked at lots of different kinds of viruses in this course. Naked icosahedra. We've looked at enveloped icosahedra. We have looked at enveloped viruses um, that, are, that have a uh, helical genome inside. And all of these, you could actually predict how they're going to be formed. So if I show you an icosahedral virus, you're going to be able to predict pretty much how it's formed. If I show you a virus with an envelope, again, you're going to know after today's lecture how that's formed. So just looking at the particle can tell you a lot about the assembly pathways. All right, so this is a good exam question, I think, to put an icon of a virus there and tell me what steps this has to go through to get uh, assembled. You can do it by looking at them. Now remember that as, as with every other stage of replication of viruses, the host is essential, okay? And that's going to be uh, obvious today as well. The assembly part of infection requires chaperones. These are cellular proteins that help viral proteins fold properly. Transport systems are really important. We're going to talk about viral subunits going from one part of the cell to the other. That happens by using transport system. The secretory pathway is a big uh, component of bringing glycoproteins to the right place in the cell and also for moving components uh, around in the cell. And as you know, many DNA viruses replicate their genomes in the nucleus, so you have to have import and export machinery as well. So another many reasons why the cell is really important for virus assembly. Now, a really key principle in assembly is nothing happens fast in dilute solution. So virus assembly pathways have evolved to concentrate the components, okay, so that the assembly happens quickly. If they were very dilute, the assembly would take too long. So, for example, in infected cells, you can often see by light microscopy what we call factories or inclusions. And these are places where assembly is taking place. It doesn't just happen all over the cytoplasm. It happens in very specific foci. So that's a way of concentrating the components so the reactions go faster. 
An example of a, a viral factory or inclusion is shown in the micrograph on the lower right. Uh, this is a neuron infected with rabies virus. And uh, these infected cells have very typical inclusion bodies. They have a name. They're called Negri bodies. So pathologists years ago used to look at infected cells and they would see these inclusions. And for, they were characteristic for different viruses. So the ones for rabies were different from pox, were different from measles. So these are called Negri bodies. Uh, here's a neuron right here. And these dark staining uh, places are where the virus is assembly. The, these are the factories. So lots of viral components, proteins, and RNAs getting assembled there. Uh, another virus that does the similar thing is poliovirus. It replicates its genome on the surfaces of vesicles that it induces in the infected cell. We talked about this in RNA synthesis some time ago. Here is the cytoplasm of a cell infected with poliovirus. And you can see that there are double membraned vesicles uh, filling the cytoplasm. The virus induces these, and these are the sites of viral RNA synthesis. And again, the idea here is that the reaction, in this case RNA synthesis, goes much faster if you have all the components in one place. In this case, the place is the surface of a membrane. All right? So that's just two ways this happens. Every virus has its own way of concentrating its components so that assembly uh, happens quickly. The other key point is that virus proteins that are going to be built into virions or virus particles have to go to the right place in the cell, whether that means uh, a membrane or a factory or the nucleus or some kind of some part of the secretory pathway. It, ha it has to get there, and they do so by having what we call addresses. And there are many different kinds of addresses that proteins can have. Uh, for example, there are membrane targeting addresses, signal sequences, the end termini of proteins destined for secretion have the signal sequence on them. And as we'll see later, many viral proteins have their end termini covalently linked to <coughs> lipids. And this targets them to a membrane without having to worry about a signal sequence. There are membrane retention signals, sequences in proteins that keep the protein in the membrane. So for example, in the endoplasmic reticulum, some proteins will get in and then pass out, but if you have a retention signal, you will stay there. The very famous nuclear localization sequences. These are short amino stretches of a very specific amino acids that allow a protein to get into the nucleus. Here are two examples uh, down here at the bottom. This is a viral uh, nuclear localization sequence. It happens to be in the T antigen of SV40. And uh, it is just a short stretch of hydrophobic, basic hydrophobic uh, amino acids shown here. If you take these amino acids and put them in any other protein, that protein will get imported into the nucleus. Now, of course, T antigen ne needs to get in the nucleus because it's made in the cytoplasm. It needs to go in the nucleus so it can bind to the viral origin of replication and stimulate DNA replication and, and transcription. And here's a different kind of nuclear localization signal found in a cellular protein. So any protein that needs to get in the nucleus has this. This allows the protein to interact with the nuclear import machinery. And finally, there are also export signals. If the protein wants to get out of the nucleus, many viral proteins first go in and then have to get out. They have export signals as well. So addresses are important for bringing the viral components to the right place in the cell. So here's an example of nuclear localization. There are a couple of viruses that we have talked about which need to bring some components in the nucleus. So the polyoma viruses, SV40, they make their structural proteins in the cytoplasm, VP1, VP2, and VP3. And you may remember these viruses have to replicate their genomes in the nucleus. And so rather than shipping the DNA out, to assemble a particle in the cytoplasm, the structural components have nuclear localization signals. They get into the nucleus, and there the new virus particles are formed. Same for adenovirus. There's a DNA virus that replicates its genome in the nucleus. The structural components are made in the cytoplasm. They have nuclear localization signals, and they get in uh, the nucleus that way. So most DNA viruses will bring their structural components 
into the nucleus. What is the one exception that we've talked about? Is pox virus. So that will be out here in the cytoplasm and doesn't deal with the nucleus at all. Now here's an RNA virus that has to get its protein in the nucleus. The nucleoprotein, the NP of influenza virus, uh, goes into the nucleus. This virus is weird for an RNA virus. It replicates its RNA in the nucleus. Um, and so to get out, it actually binds the nucleoprotein. Uh, it assembles as a ribonucleoprotein complex and then comes back out again. We'll look at that later to see how the virus particles are formed. All right, so that's an example of nuclear localization. Let's look at uh, localization of proteins to the plasma membrane. You probably know that if the cell wants to make membrane proteins, it, uh, it translates those mRNAs encoding them on the uh, endoplasmic reticulum. So the ribosomes are bound to the ER. They translate the messenger RNA in the cytoplasm and the protein goes into the lumen of the ER by virtue of the signal sequence at the end terminus. And then those proteins are shipped up to the plasma mm -hmm. membrane uh, through the Golgi apparatus. And these, these are shipped up through vesicles that pinch off the ER. They fuse with the Golgi. They migrate through the Golgi stacks. And then at the very end, uh, the vesicles pinch off the Golgi to go to the cell surface. And they fuse with the plasma membrane and deliver the uh, membrane-bound proteins there. So viral glycoproteins <coughs> that are destined for the plasma membrane follow the same pathway. They don't invent anything. They use the cellular protein export pathway. And you can see here another component. These are microtubules that help to move these vesicles. The vesicles don't just float around in the cytoplasm. We used to think they did years ago, but we now know they attach to motor proteins on microtubules, and they are actively brought up uh, to the cell surface. So two examples of targeting uh, viral proteins to the place where they need to be in order to be assembled. So let's take this first question. I think it's already up on the Socrative. Wh which of the following does not play a role in virus assembly? Okay, number two. That's right. Dilute solutions do not play a role, right? Nothing happens fast in a dilute solution. Viruses have evolved to concentrate their components so they're not dilute and reactions proceed quickly. The host nuclear import and export machinery certainly is involved. We just talked about that. Nuclear localization signals, of course, to get things in the nucleus, you need an NLS. Signal sequences for putting viral proteins at the plasma membrane. Uh, so five is obviously wrong, so it's uh, dilute solutions. All right, now when we assemble virus particles, all, pretty much all viruses make what we call subassemblies, something less than the whole virus particle. So a subassembly is defined simply as uh, part of the virus less than the whole, all right? And here we're going to look at three strategies for doing this. And the first is assembly from individual protein molecules. And we're illustrating this for two DNA viruses. So first, SV40. One of the subunits of the capsid is called a pentamer. It's made up of five copies of VP1. And you have a number of these fitting together to form the capsid. So this is a subassembly. It's made up of more than one protein, but it's not the whole capsid. So what happens here is SV40 simply makes the individual components. The mRNAs are translated uh, in the cytoplasm on ribosomes. Uh, and these form VP1 and VP2 slash VP3. And these assemble to form this subassembly. Very straightforward. Make the individual proteins. They have a natural affinity for one another. They come together they form this pentamer, which is the subassembly. Another example on the bottom is adenovirus, the icosahedral virus with the interesting fibers at each five-fold axis of symmetry. And we're going to make part of those fiber uh, assemblies. So the virus translates mRNAs, or the cell translates viral mRNAs encoding protein 4, which forms a fiber. So three of protein four come together to form a fiber. So this is a kind of subassembly in itself. And then the penton base, which is where this fiber fits in on the capsid, is made up of uh, five copies of protein three. That's a subassembly itself. And then they, they, the two subassemblies come together to form another subassembly. Okay, so you're getting the idea. These are more than just one protein. So protein four is not a subassembly. It's just a single protein. But the fiber is a subassembly, the penton base is, and of course, so is the adeno, uh, so is the penton. 
All right, so making individual proteins, they have an affinity for one another, they evolve that way, they form subassemblies. Uh, here's another way, and this is how coronaviruses do it, assembly from a polyprotein precursor. So you remember the pecorna genome is a long RNA that encodes a polyprotein. Polyprotein is synthesized and it contains proteases, enzymes that chop up the pro polyprotein to make the final proteins. So here we have the polyprotein uh, being translated on the viral uh, RNA. Here's the polyprotein coming off and folding. VP1, VP2, VP3, and VP4. So it's translated as a complete precursor. And then uh, this is processed by protease. It actually folds first to look like the form that it is in the capsid, and then the ends are clipped by the viral protease. So this is a what's called a 5S structural unit. It's simply composed of one copy of each of the four viral capsid proteins. It's a subassembly, four capsid proteins, but you're going to need 60 of these to form the final virus capsid. So that's a polyprotein precursor. And finally, we have a, a nice example of a different uh, kind of subassembly formation. This one needs a chaperone. So again, it's very much like the, one of the examples we saw just before, uh, making the individual polypeptides. In this case, um, protein 2, which is going to form uh, a hexon trimer. But it can't do it on its own. It needs a, a, a viral chaperone, which is called the L4 protein. So again, chaperones are proteins that help other proteins assemble or become what they need to be. Sometimes they can be cellular. Many viruses encode their own chaperones. And so here is a case where a chaperone is needed to, to make the final subassembly. So again, this is composed of three copies of protein 2 that don't quite fold correctly unless the chaperone helps them. All right, so that is, that's three ways to make subassemblies. We'll see some more of this as we go through different assembly schemes. But subassemblies are a key part of many virus assembly schemes. Now, another key principle, if you will, is sequential assemblies. And I think you've already gotten a sense of this from looking at subassembly formation. Things happen in a specific <coughs> order. You make two different proteins, they form multimers, and then they assemble, and that becomes part of a capsid, for example. So sequential capsid assembly is illustrated here for poliovirus, and we'll see many other examples of this today. So we're looking actually at the whole infectious cycle here, but what I want you to focus on is the translation of the polyprotein and its cleavage. And here is the 5S structural unit that we just looked at in the previous slide. So that's a subassembly of the capsid. It's made by translation of the P1 region. It folds and it gets cleaved by viral proteases. Five of these 5S structural units assemble to form what are called pentamers. So the 5S structural unit is a subassembly. So is the pentamer, because it's composed of five copies of the 5S, but it's not the whole capsid. Uh, and then finally, 12 of these pentamers will go to form the intact virion. Now, uh, what we think happens is that the viral RNA binds these pentamers, uh, and then the pentamers assemble to form the capsid itself. So again, subassemblies are a key part of this, you can see. But also there's a sequence of events that happen. They have to happen in a certain way. You can't uh, go from this to binding RNA. You first have to make a pentamer before uh, the RNA can be bound and so forth. Sequential assembly. <coughs> and that's also shown here for a bacteriophage, even more so because we know for this particular tailed bacteriophage, all the components that have to go into it and the order in which they do so. So here is a, this is actually not only illustrating sequential assembly, but the, the idea of an assembly line. You put a part, you have a car and you're building it. You start with the frame and you add parts to it. It has to all happen in a certain sequence. And if you get a car and you're going to put a door handle on it, but there's no door, it has to go back. Right, it's got, it's, you're the quality control check for the door. And it's the same with this viral assembly line. For example, here, 
uh, the, the icosahedral head of the phage is assembled from a number of proteins. These numbers are just the names of the proteins that go to make up the head. It goes through a series, a series of steps before it becomes mature. And then it's attached to this tail structure, which is a helical structure. That in itself goes through a whole series of very specific steps to form it. You have the base plate being put together, and then this rod, and then finally it's wrapped around by a helical protein, and then that's joined to this. And then the tail fibers are also assembled separately through a number of steps, and then finally attached at the bottom. So all happening in a precise sequence. So you have orderly formation of very discrete and specific intermediates. And the key here, the reason this probably evolved like this, is so quality control. You can't proceed unless the preceding subunit is correct. So if you don't have a tail formed, this capsid is just going to sit there. It doesn't go any further. And if it's malformed in some way, it probably won't assemble either. So se sequential assembly pathways common for many viruses help assure quality control. Here's another um, example of, of sequential assembly. This is for herpes virus now. And this is a DNA virus which assembles in the nucleus. And it doesn't tell us anything unusual with one exception, that a scaffolding protein is used in a very unusual way. So this virus replicated its DNA in the nucleus. So all of the proteins that make up the capsid are shipped into the nucleus. So here you have all the components made. This is a great illustration of that generalization I made very early in the course that viruses make all the parts and put them together. So here are the parts of herpes viruses, uh, the VP26 pentamers and hexamers, triplexes of various proteins, and their single portal protein. These all get shipped in the nucleus, and they assemble what's called a procapsid. Now you see on this procapsid, it's an icosahedral shell, the interior is filled with what's called a protein scaffold. So apparently this particle is so big that it just can't form on its own, it needs a scaffold. But this is an unusual scaffold, you know, if you see buildings being built here in New York, the scaffolds are on the exterior of the building. But this one is an interior scaffold. This is a scaffold built up of these VP24, uh, VP21 and pre-VP22 proteins and the capsid is then assembled around it. It gives it stability. All right, once the capsid is formed, you don't need the scaffold anymore, and so it's digested away. And what digests it away is actually one of the components of the scaffold is actually a protease, which is activated when the scaffold and the capsid is complete. So the protease digests away the scaffold, and then the genomic DNA goes in while the scaffolding bits go out. And of course, the DNA is put in uh, at the portal right there. There's one portal per capsid, you may remember. Uh, there's the portal there, and the genomic DNA is threaded in. So it's a neat way, it's a neat example of sequential assembly, but in this case, we have a, a kind of unusual scaffold involved. And another example of a DNA virus that gets assembled in the nucleus, this is also we think this is sequential assembly. This slide actually has two alternative pathways, but let me tell you what's going on. This is adenovirus, which is replicating its uh, DNA in the nucleus. Here's a strand of DNA. So it ships all of its structural proteins uh, into the nucleus. It ships protein two, and the protein two becomes a trimer in the nucleus, other virion proteins. And also the subunits of the penton uh, get made in the cytoplasm, they get shipped inside and assembled in the cytoplasm. Uh, and then you form empty capsids, and then the DNA is threaded into the empty capsid. So that's sequential assembly. You make the parts of the capsid, you make the capsid, and then you put the DNA into the capsid. Now, it, another idea for how adenoviruses assemble is called concerted assembly. And this is, um, a mechanism whereby the DNA and the capsid form together. We'll see another example of this in a moment with influenza virus. So in other words, uh, you don't make a capsid and put the DNA in it. That would be sequential. Concerted is when everything assembles all at once from the components. The DNA and the capsid uh, all combine together to form the virion. It doesn't, for your purposes, you don't really need to know which is the correct pathway. Just the fact that sequential 
means you put things in a certain order, the last thing the nucleic acid goes in and concerted, assembly happens pretty much all at once. Now many viral proteins can come together spontaneously and form the particle. Some of the sub, many of the subunits, of course, can do that. You can express the SV40 proteins, VP1, 2, and 3, and they will assemble into a penton. You can express, you can produce, um, what was the other one uh, on that slide? An adenovirus hexon and the polypeptides will come together. The fiber and the penton base will all come together. So these, we say, have the, have the properties of self-assembly. And in fact, some viral proteins can stimulate the assembly of the entire virion. So for example, the, the gag precursor of retroviruses, it contains uh, the structural proteins that make up the capsid. If you just make that in a cell, you'll get particles made. Uh, the HA of influenza virus, which is nothing more than a membrane glycoprotein, if you produce that in cells, you will get particles made. And the same with hepatitis B surface antigen. So these proteins, we, ha we say, have the property of self-assembly. They can make particles in the absence of everything else. Other viruses require assisted assembly. They can't make a particle by themselves. So you can express subunits of the virus, but they don't assemble into particles. Uh, other viral proteins, sometimes cellular chaperones and even nucleic acid genomes, are required to form the structure. So here is now an example of a virus that's produced by budding, and this is influenza virus. And this is another illustration of what I call concerted assembly. The virus particles assemble only together with the viral genome. So the previous example was adenovirus. You make the DNA, and then the individual subassemblies of the capsid all come together to form the intact particle. So for influenza virus, uh, the genome replicates in the nucleus. And here are new negative strand RNAs in the upper right that have been made. Uh, they have to be bound by, they are bound by the nucleocapsid protein. You can tell that they are all, all coded. They look different from these squigglies over here. So the nucleocapsid protein has been made uh, in the cytoplasm. It's come in and bound to the RNAs. Uh, and then the, that, that assembly is also bound by uh, the M1 protein. So M1 is produced in the cytoplasm. It's imported. It has an NLS. It's imported. It binds to the RNA protein complex, and that gets exported into the cytoplasm. So now each of the eight segments of RNA bound to proteins, including M1, eventually make their way to the plasma membrane, uh, and then the particle forms. So that's concerted assembly. You don't make the particle first and then put the genome in it. The particle and, in this case, the membrane interact to make the particle all at once. Okay, so that's the idea behind concerted assembly. We'll talk more about the budding process later on today. I just wanted to show you the hemagglutinin and protein. We've talked a lot about its function in infection. Now, the influenza virion shown here has several protein in, in its membrane. The hemagglutinin is the major one. That's the attachment protein. Uh, the neuraminidase is shown here. This is an enzyme that cleaves sialic acids from cells. And then, of course, there's the uh, M2 ion channel. So let's focus on the hemagglutin. And this, you remember, is a trimer on the virion surface. The trimer is shown at the right. It, is a fibrous, it has a fibrous stem and a globular head. And the head, of course, has the sialic acid binding site. This is what binds the cell receptor, which is sialic acid. Now, here is a linear schematic of the HA protein. This is, of course, a transmembrane protein, very short piece of protein in, in the interior of the virion. Most of it is external. And this, is, this has no resemblance to what the protein looks like in real life, of course, but this is for illustrative purposes. You can see the protein is modified with sugars. It's glycosylated. has a lot of disulfide bonds to maintain this structure. But the most important thing I want to show you is the fusion peptide here, all the way down very close to the membrane. Remember, the fusion peptide is what will fuse the viral envelope with the endosome as the pH drops. This fusion peptide has to be exposed in order for that fusion to occur. And to do that, it has to be cleaved right there where the orange arrow is. All right, the fusion peptide in the model of the HA shown in the upper right is way down at the bottom. 
And if the HA is not cleaved, when the pH drops, the fusion peptide will not be exposed and it will not insert into the endosome membrane. So cleavage and low pH are both needed for fusion mediated by that peptide. So I just wanted to show you where this is located in the protein. This has to be cleaved. That gives you a free end terminus, which can then raise up uh, and be inserted into the endosome membrane at low pH. Now that HA is translated on the endoplasmic reticulum by ribosomes, because it's destined for the plasma membrane. So it's translated onto the ER. It goes in uh, the lumen of the ER. It has a signal sequence, which directs its entry into the ER lumen. And then it moves through the secretory pathway, uh, through vesicles, through the Golgi network, and eventually up to the plasma membrane. And as it moves through the ER and Golgi, it is glycosylated in various ways. Uh, the, you can see all these reactions occurring here, oligomerization, trimming of various sugars and so forth, and in some cases cleavage of the HA may occur uh, in the uh, Golgi network. And eventually here's the protein as it appears on the plasma membrane. It's the transmembrane segment. This is the external part of the HA, and here's the cleaved uh, fusion peptide and terminus. Uh, interestingly, the C-terminus of the HA is also modified with a lipid, and that attaches it to the membrane. This apparently is important for uh, forming a particle. Okay, the answer is all of the above. So let's take a look at that. So subassemblies are part of all of these different things that I've told you. Concerted, concerted assembly, sequential, doesn't matter whether the capsid comes together all at once or in stages. Assembly lines, for sure and chaperone-assisted assembly. So sub-assemblies are part of all of this. It's not specific to any of these individual types of assembly. All right, now we've, we've talked about how you build a particle. The next thing that's very important, of course, is to get the genome inside of it. And the key here is that when viruses replicate, either in the nucleus and the cytoplasm, there's lots of other nucleic acid around. There's cellular DNA in the nucleus, there's RNA in the cytoplasm. So how does the virus package only its own nucleic acid? It doesn't want to package cellular nucleic acid. That would be wasteful. So what it does is packaging signals in the viral genome. These are specific sequences that will recognize the capsid or somehow direct the nucleic acid into the capsid, all right? Packaging signals. So let's look at them for both DNA and RNA viruses. Packaging signals are defined genetically. You make mutations in the genome of the virus, and that prevents the genome from getting into the particle. So here on the top, for example, is the packaging, a bunch, the packaging sequences of adenovirus. And the packaging sequences are shown as these little blue arrows here. There are multiple packaging sequences. Uh, and you can see that um, they, are, they are at one end of the genome. So here is the left-hand end of the ad genome. That's the origin of one of the two origins of replication. And this, these are the number of bases from that left end. So they're all between two and 400 bases from the left end of the genome. So you can see that there, there are multiple uh, packaging sequences. Some of them overlap. And they also overlap uh, the enhancer sequence. So this is an enhancer for the E1A promoter at the right here. This is a sequence that enhances the transcription at this promoter. And the um, packaging sequences overlap that as well. These happen to be recognized by a viral structural protein. It's called 4A2, and that directs the genome into the capsid. And 4A2 is also a transcriptional activator. So again, the theme that viral proteins often have several functions. At the bottom is the packaging signal for SP40. It's this series of uh, bases around here. You can see that it overlaps with a series of SP1 binding sites. These are transcription factors that are needed for transcription of the early unit here. You can see it's right next to the origin of replication. So very compact genome. All these signals, transcription, DNA replication, packaging, they're all in a very close area. But the point here is that these are defined sequences, you need these to get the DNA in the capsid. If you take these away by mutation, the DNA will not go in the capsid. So cellular, se cellular DNAs do not have these packaging sequences. These sequences do not exist in our genome, so our DNA is not packaged. 
the herpes virus genome has a similar approach. It has packaging sequences as well. It's just a little more complicated. Uh, the, here's the herpes virus genome at the top. And the packaging sequences are called PAC1 and PAC2. They're at uh, the left end here. And these packaging sequences, together with a number of viral proteins, recognize the portal. Remember, the portal, there's one of these portals on every virion. It has a pore in it through which DNA gets in and out. So if you're replicating herpes DNA, you have to figure out a way to get it into the capsid. The capsid is formed first, as we saw previously with the internal uh, scaffold. These packaging sequences, PAC1 and PAC2, recognized by these viral proteins, they bind it to the portal. And then there's a motor as part of this portal that winds the DNA into the capsid. You can see that happening here. So remember the herpes genome replicates by rolling circle. It makes concatomers, long multi-genome unit molecules. So here we have a two unit concatomer going in. The capsid fills up with DNA. And then you see at this point, there are now two of the packaging sequences opposed to one another. So this whole region, PAC, DR, PAC, there's one copy here and one copy on the other part of the DNA. Once they get together, that's recognized that they're aligned. So the machinery says, I have a complete genome now in the capsid because I have these two markers for either end present. Uh, that is cleaved uh, and ligated, and now you have a, a DNA in the capsid. So that's a very clever way of packaging DNA. You have a signal, and as soon as the, uh, the signal that a full genome is present is, is in, then that gets cleaved. And this DNA will then go on to interact with another capsid and be pumped into that. Yes? What's a concatomer? Oh, so a concatomer is just multiple units of the genome length. So if the genome is 1,000 <laughs> bases long, a concatomer could be 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. You have unit length. Uh, duplicates of the genome, yes? Um, if, uh, if these packaging sequences are unique to viruses, uh, can they be targeted uh, you know, in therapies? So the question is, if the packaging sequences are unique to viruses, could you use them as targets for antiviral therapy? So uh, in, in principle, you could. The problem is how. Uh, the best way would probably be a protein, but those are typically not good therapeutics. And a small molecule, no one as far as I know has found a small molecule that would bind this. But yeah, that in theory would be a good target. Yes? For how the uh, DNA comes in contact with the cap capsids, is it just simple diffusion since they're so concentrated? So this assembly is happening in the nucleus, and it's on, spe it's on very specific sites. Remember the factories or uh, you know, inclusion bodies, this where this virus, it goes to very specific places in the nucleus, so everything is concentrated, so the likelihood of it interacting is very high. Yes? And, um, for the, on the previous slide, do the enhancers um, silence the <coughs> packaging signals or not? The question is, do the enhancers silence the packaging signals? No, they do not. Okay, so there's a risk that they can be packaged away while they're being transcribed or not? Well, this, the packaging is tending to happen later in infection when you don't need as much transcription, so that may be a division between those two functions. All right, so those are a couple of examples of DNA virus packaging signals. RNA viruses also have packaging signals. Uh, this is an example of a retrovirus packaging signal. This happens to be the HIV-1 genome. Uh, at the bottom here, it's the, le it's the left end. And at this uh, left end, there's a signal called psi. That red Greek letter is a psi. And that's P, of course. And P is packaging. Right? So the psi signal in, is what is the packaging sequence in retroviruses. Uh, this is necessary for packaging. It's not enough. You need other signals in the genome. But if you have this psi signal absent, if you take it out, the RNA will not package at all. This um, psi sequence is, has a lot of RNA secondary structure. And um, the way it's thought to work is that, remember, the retroviruses have two copies of the RNA in the particle. And these, these are two different stem loops from the packaging signal. It's this stem loop right here from two different RNAs and their base pairing. Okay, so this is one of the ways that this packaging signal is thought to bring two RNAs into the particle by allowing them to base pair. And then there are proteins involved that interact with this signal as well. We'll, show, we'll see an example of that in the next slide. 
So here's an example of packaging signals in, in retroviruses with simpler genomes. The HIV is a member of a group of retroviruses. We say they have complex genomes. They make a lot of proteins, and we'll see later. Everything is just more complicated. These are uh, mouse and bird retroviruses, Maloney, murine, leukemia virus, avian leukosis <coughs> virus. They have simple genomes. So the Maloney genome is shown at the top here. It's the whole genome. Remember, it's an mRNA, a plus-stranded RNA. And, and there are two of them in the particle. Here is the packaging sequence for Maloney, that psi signal. Now, if you take that psi signal and you put it in any mRNA, you can get that packaged into a retrovirus particle. And that's the basis for gene therapy, using viruses for gene therapy, which we'll talk about at the end of this course. So the sequence, which is very short, it's not it's a few hundred bases long at the most, you can put it into any RNA, and in an infected cell, that RNA will get packaged. So that's a very interesting location. It's just downstream of the five prime splice site. So you remember the entire Maloney or the retroviral mRNA needs to be translated to give you the gag precursor. But you also need to do a splice from there to there to get the envelope mRNA so that you can make the glycoprotein. Can't access the envelope open reading frame from the unspliced mRNA. Now look at how well this is designed. When you splice out from here to here, you remove the packaging sequence. So that means the envelope mRNA will never be packaged, which makes sense, right? Because the envelope mRNA is very short. It's missing gag and pull. If you package that, that would be a waste. So the solution is to put the psi sequence in, this, in the uh, intron, basically. So the full-length RNAs are packaged and not the envelope RNAs. Now, that's a very nice solution. Unfortunately, ALV uh, doesn't, doesn't follow the same beautiful logic. Its splice site is upstream of the five prime splice site. But in fact, the full-length uh, mRNA is preferentially packaged. Very little envelope is packaged, despite the fact that envelope has the packaging sequence. The envelope mRNA has the packaging sequence. So for this, something else probably in the intron is necessary for splicing. Uh, the way this packaging sequence works is shown here. Uh, one R if you have one RNA, the packaging sequence looks like this, two stem loops. This red part here is the binding site for the nucleocapsid protein. The nucleocapsid is what is going to bind the RNA at the packaging sequence and direct it to new virions. When you have two RNAs in the virion, then they base pair with each other. So you can see one RNA here is in green and the other is in uh, kind of yellow. And they are base pairing with each other very much the way the two HIV packaging sequences base paired in the previous slide. When these RNAs do this, it exposes the nucleocapsid binding site. So here, the nucleocapsid binding sites are base paired. They're not accessible. When the two RNAs in the particle base pair like this, it exposes these binding sites. The nucleocapsid protein can bind to this packaging sequence. And then nucleocapsid will bind another viral protein to direct it uh, into virion. So a very clever way of using a packaging sequence. All right, so those are for viruses with one RNA genome. It's pretty straightforward. What about segmented RNA viruses like influenza or rio viruses? How do they make sure not only that they just package viral RNAs, but how do they make sure they put the right number in each particle? Influenza has to have eight RNAs. If it has less, it's not going to be infectious could have so, a little bit more, but most particles don't have all that many more RNAs. So here's a nice drawing of the influenza particle to remind you of the segmented nature of the RNA. It's in eight pieces. How do you get them all in the particle? Well, some people think there's a random model where you basically just package whatever you can grab. And if you did that, if you do the math, it turns out that you would get one infectious particle for every 400 assembled. So in other words, if you package randomly eight segments, you pull them out of the pool of RNAs in the cell, one in 400 would get the right eight, no duplications, no missing segments, and they would be infections. And that's in line with the particle to PFU ratio of this virus. So a random uh, system could be in, in effect. However, more recently, there's experimental evidence that each end has a specific packaging sequence that directs it into the virion and makes sure that only eight different RNAs get packaged. 
And uh, an illustration of some of the data for that is shown on the right on this slide. This is an electron micrograph <coughs> of influenza virus particles. And you can see in the middle of these particles, or these are the ribonuclear proteins. These are the segmented RNAs. These have been cut. These have been optically sectioned so that we're cutting across the RNPs. And you can see they are uh, organized in a very specific pattern. So they're not just randomly sitting in the particle as would be implied by by this illustration. They're actually oriented in a very specific way, more like uh, this illustration here at the top. The RNAs are lined up, and we think these are lined up because of sequences that are complementary uh, at their ends. So maybe those uh, direct the packaging of the genome in this way. Now there's some viruses where you have, to, you have sequential packaging of the segmented genome. In other words, you, you have to put one in first, and then the next one comes in because the first one is there and so forth. And here's an example of a bacteriophage that does this. These are very much like real viruses, except they infect bacteria. They have two capsid shells, and they have a segmented RNA genome. This is double-stranded RNA. There are three RNA segments. And the way these get in is very interesting. First, uh, it packages the small RNA. So that's the only one that can go in first, apparently has a signal that gets it in there. Then the M, the medium RNA, goes in next, and it will only go in part, into particles that have S in it already. And finally, the L segment goes in, and that only goes in if S and M are present. So we call this a serial dependence of packaging. This seems to be very effective because the particle to PFU ratio is one. In other words, if, if this were a random mechanism, you would expect, I don't know what the number would be for three segments, but for flu with eight segments, it would be one in 400 if you just randomly grabbed eight. But obviously this virus is not just randomly grabbing three because its particle to PFU ratio is one. Packaging signals on viral blank interact with viral blank during virus assembly. Two different words here. Good. Number three. Now, a packaging signal is in the viral genome. Okay, so that's the only one with genome there. Packaging signals on viral genomes interact with viral proteins during virus assembly. The packaging signals are not on lipids. Uh, they are on, they're not on proteins, sorry. They are on genomes. They're not on proteases, and they're not on proteins. This is reversed, so the correct one is number three. Packaging, so the key here is a packaging signal is on a genome and it interacts with viral proteins to get the genome into the particle. Very straightforward. Okay, we got a genome. Let's get an envelope for those viruses that need an envelope. Let's talk about how this works. And there are two general patterns. The envelope is acquired uh, after the internal components assemble, and that's what we saw for influenza virus. Remember, the RNP is produced in the nucleus, it's shipped up to the plasma membrane, and then the envelope is acquired. Most of the envelope viruses do that. The retroviruses are somewhat different. There, the, the uh, envelope is acquired as the particle is being assembled, and we'll talk about this in some detail in a moment. Now, the, the budding reaction can be driven by different kinds of viral proteins. And there, there are four different ways that that can work, shown here. In, in the simplest case, a single viral protein is enough to drive the formation of a bud. So if you take the DNA, say, for the influenza virus HA protein, and you put that DNA in a cell and you let it direct the synthesis of HA, those cells will make particles. The HA alone is enough to drive a bud. And we'll talk about this later. This is actually a vaccine strategy for influenza virus. For most viruses, you need a different number of proteins to drive uh, budding. For example, here you need the glycoproteins as well as a capsid protein to drive budding. Here you need a matrix protein only. So matrix is the, typically this protein that lines uh, underneath the membrane. In some cases you can just produce that in cells and you'll get uh, the, the budding made. And for other viruses, uh, you need the matrix as well as glycoprotein. So different combinations. I particularly like these single protein butters like the, the flu HA because that you can make a vaccine without any genetic information in it. Remember this number three here has no nucleic acid. You can just produce the HA alone and you make a non-infectious vaccine. 
So the way the influenza budding is accomplished, you've seen already, but let's uh, re-emphasize it. This is a case, as a case for most envelope viruses, where the internal structure assembly and the budding uh, happen separately and come together to stimulate the envelope. So remember, the nuclear protein is assembled in the nucleus. It's shipped out. It makes its way to the plasma membrane, and then the virus particle forms. So that's the way most envelope viruses do it. They make the two the components that have to go in the envelope and then that uh, stimulates budding. Yeah? Uh, do the proteins, are these proteins recruiting the cells in the or is it just the protein itself that's in the cell? So the movement is clearly microtubule based. Uh, they, th I'll show you in a minute how these proteins get to the plasma membrane. They have modifications on them that target it to but the plasma. The Ah, the budding, yes. The budding absolutely uses a cellular process. We're going to talk about that as well. So how does this, you may be interested to know, how does this RNA protein complex get to the plasma membrane? Or what are the signals that drive it? And some of those are shown here. So I've taken the same illustration to keep you focused on what we're talking about, the viral RNA protein assembly getting to the plasma membrane. If we look at the M protein, now let's go back, and that M protein is this blue rectangle bound to the RNA. It gets bound to the RNA in the nucleus. The M protein has signals that tell it to go to the plasma membrane. It has hydrophobic regions uh, at the end terminus. So this allows the protein to go to the plasma membrane. You can see it also has a nuclear localization signal that gets it to the nucleus in the first place. It also has an RNA binding motif. Makes perfect sense, right? Because Look, the M protein has to bind both RNA and the membrane. So that's how it does both. If you mess with these sequences, you can alter them by mutation. You will interfere with virus budding. VSV has an M protein uh, that has a similar property, binding the RNA, getting it to the plasma membrane. And you can see it has membrane binding sequences as well as RNA binding sequences. So that's how these things are targeted to the right place in the cell. So here is how the retrovirus buds. This is different from most of the other envelope viruses because the particle is forming in the process of budding. And what does that mean? So let's start with the genomic RNA. This is produced in the cell nucleus by Paul II, Paul II transcribing the proviral DNA. And every retrovirus is going to encapsulate two RNAs. Uh, they find each other via that packaging sequence. And then the nucleocapsid protein binds the viral RNA. The nucleocapsid is this NC protein right here. It's the light blue one that's a sphere, okay? So that binds the packaging sequence. Then this assembly goes to the plasma membrane. Now in the plasma membrane, the viral glycoproteins have already been inserted. How does this RNA get to the plasma membrane. Well, the proteins of this virus are made as precursors, which are then cleaved. But the cleaved products typically remain in association with each other. So for example, you can make this, this is the gag precursor protein. It's cleaved to form the matrix protein, which is the blue protein lining underneath the plasma membrane. The capsid is gonna form uh, the shell of the virus, which is shown in the upper right. The nucleocapsid binds the RNA, uh, and uh, this is another component of the virion P6. So when this is produced and cleaved, you get proteins that look like this. So you have here matrix capsid, uh, nucleocapsid, and here we even have protease and reverse transcriptase and integrase in this particular one. But look at this one right here. This has matrix protein, capsid, and nucleocapsid. The nucleocapsid will bind the RNA then the matrix protein has signals to bring it to the plasma membrane, just like the matrix protein or the M1 protein of the influenza virus. We'll look at those in a minute, I think. So the nucleocapsid is binding matrix through the capsid, and that brings it up to the plasma membrane. So most of the assemblies look like this. Every now and then, one of these molecules on the right here gets incorporated, and that gives you a reverse transcriptase, and an integrase, and a protease. Protease is needed, that's the, the protease is the yellow one. It's needed to cleave everything afterwards. So the assembly forms here at the surface, 
it begins to bud out, but it's not a particle yet. Here we have an envelope, uh, completely surrounded particle, but it's not a mature virion. Only when this protease does its work, this yellow protease, does it become a mature particle. And now you can see that the capsid is properly formed. So that's what we mean that budding and assembly occurs together. It's different from influenza where you assemble the RNA, it goes to the membrane, and then it forms a particle. Here, the particle is formed only after it's budded. So again, that's the concept I want you to remember. And also that the RNA is directed to the plasma membrane via this multi-protein interaction. Now gag alone will make particles. If you just express this protein, you can make particles in cells. So you don't need to have RNA present. But if viral RNA is present, it will be incorporated. How does uh, the gag precursor get to the plasma membrane? Well, again, here is the gag protein, matrix capsid, nucleocapsid. The N-terminus is modified with a lipid called myristate. It's a long carbon chain uh, fatty acid, and this targets it to the plasma <coughs> membrane. So this makes the N-terminus very hydrophobic. If you, so myristate is typically attached to a single amino acid at the N-terminus of a protein. You can mutate the gene encoding gag and remove the meristylation sequence. If you do so, you don't get particles made because the gag protein cannot target the plasma membrane. So this is an essential part of the membrane targeting sequence. You can also see there are other regions of the N-terminus also important for associating with the plasma membrane. These are hydrophobic sequences as well. And as you can see in the nucleocapsid, there's RNA binding sequences. And nucleocapsid, remember, is the protein that binds the packaging sequence of the RNA, and it's what brings the whole thing to this assembly. So everything fits together. It all makes very good sense. So many proteins are modified by the addition of fatty acids. The one I've just told you about at the end terminus of GAG is meristate. That's meristate right there, typically attached to uh, a single amino acid in the protein. And again, it targets proteins to membranes. You don't need to have a signal sequence. So you can target it independently to a membrane without the signal sequence. And other modifications include uh, the addition of farnesol, for example, to, to proteins. It's another fatty acid, longer chain fatty acid here. There are many others. And all of these have the similar function. They let proteins go to membranes in the absence of a signal sequence. So they don't have to pass through the secretory pathway in order to um, hit a membrane. Now, you asked about budding before. How does budding occur? Does it use the cell machinery? So a number of years ago, people were making mutations in the genome of retroviruses. And they found a particular set of changes in uh, the GAG protein that caused an arrest in budding at this late stage. So you got these particles forming on a stalk, but the budding never finished, and they were stuck at this position. All right, so single amino acid changes in GAG can lead to this phenotype. So these were called late domains because they affect a very late part of the maturation. So remember, normally these particles would pinch off and form free virions, but because of the changes made in the GAG, they didn't go beyond this stalk-like projection. It turns out that after many years of studying, people found out that the L domains that were changed in these GAG proteins interact with cellular proteins that are involved in vesicle trafficking. There's a whole system in, in eukaryotic cells that is involved in the production of vesicles for these kinds of trafficking. And the viruses interact with it, and in particular, the gag protein of retroviruses does that. Now here on the next slide, these are called L-domain motifs. They are originally discovered in retroviruses. So here are the gag proteins of many different retroviruses. And these little symbols just show you where there are these gag, uh, sorry, where these L domain motifs located. And they come in different flavors. These are the amino acids that make them up. The point is, if you change these L domain motifs, you get budding arrested at that stalk stage. And other viruses have late domains as well. Phyloviruses, Ebola and Marburg. Uh, VSV are rhabdo and rabies, arena viruses, these structural proteins of these viruses, all of which form budding particles, 
they have late domains as well. These sequences, in particular, interact with the cellular machinery for making vesicles, and that is called the escort machinery. The escort machinery in cells is involved in activities where you have to have membranes uh, pinching off from one another, let's say. So, for example, uh, in the cell, there are structures called multivesicular endosomes. What these are, these are basically endosomes, and the outer endosomal membrane regularly pinches in to form vesicles. So these are full of tiny vesicles that originate at the outer vesicle of this structure. When these uh, invaginate and pinch off, this involves the escort machinery. The escort machinery consists of a number of proteins called escort proteins with different numbers, and they basically sit on the membrane and induce the changes that you need to make a vesicle. And these have been discovered initially in yeast by isolating mutants that are defective in these pathways. And then they were found in, in mammalian cells. When cells divide, the escort proteins are involved in the scission of this tiny piece of cytoplasm here. All right, at the mid-body, when the two cells are coming apart, the escort machinery is important for that. It's called cytokinesis. So in processes where membranes have to separate, the escort pathway is involved. Now, what viruses have done is to take hold of this pathway and use it to produce a bud. So typically, the escort pathway isn't involved in making buds at the plasma membrane. But viruses have figured out a way to interact with the escort machinery. They do so via the late domains on their structural proteins. And they induce the formation of a, uh, a budding particle. So the virus cannot make a bud on its own. It needs the escort pathway. If you mutate the escort pathway in a cell or alter it in some way, you can, you can alter it by using siRNA to knock down individual components, you will not get virus particles forming. So this is another way that the virus has taken hold of a cellular process. It absolutely needs this to make uh, the buds. Now, where do viruses acquire their envelopes? Wherever they can. Some viruses acquire them at the nuclear membrane. So herpes viruses bud through the nuclear membrane. Some viruses bud through the endoplasmic reticulum membrane. Some of them bud from the Golgi membrane. And of course, I've told you about some that bud from the plasma membrane. So if you bud from the plasma membrane, of course, you're free, ready to go. If you bud from any of these internal membranes, then you have to figure out a way to get to the cell surface. Typically, you, used to, you need to have some form of exocytosis. So let's take a look at this. Here's, here is the most extreme example. This is herpes virus. The, the capsids assemble in the nucleus. Then they acquire a membrane by budding through the nuclear membrane into the endoplasmic reticulum. So now you have a herpes capsid with a single membrane. This membrane binds to the ER and fuses and liberates the capsid into the cytoplasm. So there's no membrane on this particle. Can't get out of the cell yet. So what this does next, it, it buds into the trans-Golgi network, picks up a membrane. This then is released from the trans-Golgi by the secretory pathway. So it's released into a vesicle. So now we have a membraned herpes virus in a transport vesicle that goes to the plasma membrane, fuses and releases the virus with its membrane around the capsid. So the origin of this membrane is what part of the cell? Sorry? Yeah, it's from the Golgi. It's this membrane here. And then it's released. So kind of a Baroque way of doing things, but this is what you have to do if you bud from an interior membrane. Presumably if you bud from the ER or the Golgi, you would also be taken out by the exocytic pathway as well. All right, next question is, which statement about viral budding is incorrect? Okay, number three, exactly. <coughs> number three, no host proteins are involved in the budding process. That's not correct. Host proteins are, I just told you about the escort pathways. You can get the envelope before or simultaneous with assembly. Uh, the spike can drive budding. Lipids do assist proteins, right? They tell the M proteins where to go in the cell to the plasma membrane. 
and the viral membrane can be acquired from different places. This actually should, nobody picked this, and I'm glad you didn't, but technically it should read, budding can occur from any of these sites, because I'm not sure the nuclear membrane ever ends up on a virus particle that's outside of the cell. But you get the point. Last step is leaving the cell. And this can happen when viruses bud, which as we've talked about, the budding process releases the virus particle from the cell. For viruses that do not bud, like the coronaviruses or any virus with an icosahedral capsid, they typically leave the cell when the cell breaks open, the cell lyses. And viruses can be released at, in, in most of the cells in our bodies, the cells are polarized. They have an apical and a basal lateral domain. Viruses can be released from apical or basal lateral domains. That's not shown on this slide. Uh, they can be released from cell to cell, or they can do both. And cell to cell release has implications for, for our immune response. If, if the virus is never outside of a cell, it's very hard for our immune system to get rid of it. So we'll see the implications of that when we start to talk about pathogenesis. Here is a very extreme example of directed release of virus from a cell. So I just told you you can be released from the top or the bottom of a cell. Here's an HIV-infected T cell. And as far as we know, th these are not actually polarized in that sense because they don't form sheets of cells. But look, this is HIV particles being released at a very specific part uh, of this infected T cell. And so some mechanisms exist to direct the virus to bud at a very specific place like this. So these viruses are being released by budding. Uh, they're envelope viruses. The last question is, why do the cells die? If so budding, in many cases, viruses that are produced by budding, the cells can live for a long time before they die. But these, uh, these non-envelope viruses have to kill the cell in order to be released. And we think that's a multi-stage process. There's, as you know, and I've told you before, there's a lot of inhibition of protein synthesis, nucleic acid synthesis in the cell, and that contributes to cell death. But we now realize that there are very specific cell death pathways that are induced by virus infection. And as I've taught this course every year, there seems to be a new one. Uh, apoptosis, pyroptosis, necrosis, and autophagy. These are all different ways of the cell dying. These are all kinds of cell death pathways that are induced as a response to virus infection. So the cell is responding to a stress and the virus utilizes this to get uh, out of the cell. And so we will talk about more of these in the next couple of lectures because they're part uh, of the immune response to virus infection. And our last question for today, how do newly synthesized virus particles exit the cell? Oh, this is the first one all year. You got all right. <laughs> Look at that zero except for number five, which is the right answer. Yeah. All of the above. Thank you. <laughs>